Now I'm recording. Great. There you go. Well, first of all, thank you all for having me um, present today uh, some of our work. Uh, my name is Albert Palacios, and I'm the Digital Scholarship Coordinator here at the University of Texas at Austin. Sorry, more specifically, Lila's Benson Latin American Studies and Collections. And today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about our um, just a little bit about our projects, but focusing on one particular initiative that we've been um, having here for the past uh, two or three years. Um, but before I begin, um, I want to explain exactly what Lila's Benson Latin American Studies and Collections is. Um, Lila's Benson, it's a formal partnership between the University of Texas Libraries and the College of Liberal Arts uh, that was established in 2011. And what this does, it actually brings together under one umbrella, uh, two different entities. The first one is the Teresa Lozano Long Institute for Latin American Studies, uh, or in short, it's called LILAS, which is the academic arm of the partnership, uh, bringing in more than 100 and, uh, 150 affiliated professors from more than 30 departments throughout UT. The other element is the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection, or BLAC, or the Benson, uh, which is the library special collection entity of uh, this partnership. Uh, this library in particular is second only to the Library of Congress um, and with more than one million volumes, and this is not even including the archival section of this uh, collection. And the collection strengths, uh, they focus on Latin America, U.S. Uh, Latina, Latino studies, human rights, and uh, most recently, uh, the archive, uh, the African diaspora archive. So what this partnership does, it's really shaped uh, and integrated how we uh, how we collect. Uh, so it's really facilitated the partnership of uh, archivists, librarians, and faculty in developing our collection strengths. And it's also really innovated the way that we teach. Uh, it has really breaking broken down the metaphorical. Uh, wall between you know, the collection and the classroom, and it's allowed us to bring in uh, special collections, analog as well as digital, into the classroom and bring in that research back into the collections to enhance it, their access. Now, uh, more specifically, um, the Digital Scholarship Office, it's within, uh, it's literally squarely in the middle of this partnership. Uh, formally, it's part of the uh, Lila Spence Digital Initiatives Unit, which comprises uh, three elements. It's a digital scholarship office, the post-custodial archival development team, and the Archive of the Indigenous Languages of Latin America, or commonly known as ILA. Now, uh, our particular unit, the Digital Scholarship Office, uh, as I mentioned, it rests running between uh, that partnership. Uh, I myself, I'm the coordinator of that office, and uh, I'm a shared staff, so my salary is paid both by both uh, the University of Texas Libraries and the College of, uh, of uh, Liberal Arts. Part of our team though, uh, includes a graduate research assistant, uh, currently Joshua Ortiz Baco, who's a doctoral student in Spanish and Portuguese. And uh, we are fortunate enough to have a two year postdoctoral fellow in data creation as part of the Clear Mellon uh, program. Uh, uh, and her name is Dr. Jennifer Isasi. Collectively, what we do is a variety of, of functions. Uh, we do public programming, including um, workshops. So here in the top uh, left-hand corner, you see an exhibition that um, went to UT El Paso uh, and also went to UTRGV. And so we put together uh, uh, accompanying uh, digital scholarship workshops on mapping. The exhibition was on mapping. We also uh, manage uh, and pursue new digital humanities grants. Um, we also create and manage interinstitutional digital resources. Probably the most, uh, the best uh, example that we manage is the Primeros Libros de las Americas, uh, which you see there in the lower uh, uh, left-hand side. Um, and we also partner up with faculty and graduate student instructors to be able to bring in not only digital collections into the classroom, but also uh, bring in digital humanities practices, uh, theory and practice into uh, undergraduate as well as graduate uh, student teaching. And uh, we also um, work individually with students and early professionals uh, and mentor them um, in a program that we call our Digital Scholarship and Special Collections Internship, which is gonna be the focus of this presentation. 
Um, so this internship, essentially what we're trying to do here is we're trying to expose students uh, to the process of uh, creating digital collections, and that entails digitization, metadata, et cetera, um, and how to, uh, and also look at the different ethical issues of why we digitize, what kind of materials do we digitize, and look through um, and start developing out the collections and start seeing it as collections as data, um, enhancing the metadata uh, in a way that essentially transmor uh, transforms it into a data set. Uh, and then use that to train our intern in different open source digital scholarship platforms and uh, software. And at the end, it ends with how do you then um, uh, use everything that you've learned and teach it on to others. So it's a little bit of uh, an exposure to all aspects of uh, creating a digital special collection and how do you use it and reuse it afterwards. So what you see here is just a little glimpse of that program, which is really structured. Um, we have uh, essentially six major elements that we talk about, or six major topics or issues. Uh, one of them is special and digital collections, the nature of them. Uh, the second element is uh, uh, talking about post-custodial archives and more focused on that work. And look more closely at metadata and how representation is done uh, and the ramifications of metadata. We then look at digital preservation, uh, we start looking at the principles of collections as data, uh, and then we start exploring the software, as I mentioned, uh, in the digital methods section. And then we look at more outward uh, uh, focus uh, initiatives. How do you uh, engage the public and students um, through these materials? And more specifically, no, no. we provide, um, it's uh, for the spring semester, it's usually a 10 hour a week uh, for 15, uh, 15 week experience. And during the summer, it's typically a 35 uh, hour a week uh, for five week experience. Now, I just wanna highlight some of our student work. Uh, this one in particular, this is one of our inaugural, inaugural uh, internships. It was uh, done by a UT uh, history graduate student. Uh, her, what she did was she digitized uh, images of Mexico's uh, 1910 centenario that we have uh, in our collection, and she mapped it. Uh, this, these are over a thousand photographs that she described and created a data set out of. Um, and then at the end, she did a public workshop on how to use uh, history pin and carto. Uh, another uh, project that we have here, and this is one of our recent one, uh, we had an undergraduate Spanish and computer science undergraduate look at some of our um, uh, Mexican Revolution materials and uh, start creating pedagogical materials that we're introducing into um, a College of Education initiative that we have here, where we provide them uh, primary sources and uh, interpretive materials of our collections for them to develop world history and world geography courses. Um, this one was actually the most recent. Uh, this was created, uh, it was a collection of propaganda, Mexican uh, election propaganda. And this student, um, uh, this is the second time that we uh, recruit and bring over a student from the Escuela Nacional de Conservación, Restauración y Museología from Mexico City. Um, and he came and it's the same program and he focused on um, not only digitizing and describing this propaganda material, but creating uh, uh, text sets so that they can be used uh, in tools such as Loyon Tools. Uh, for undergraduate teaching related to the Mexican Revolution. Uh, this one here is a visualization of the photographers and their subjects uh, that a uh, School of Information uh, Capstone student uh, created uh, using Gaffey. And then this one here is an undergraduate partner uh, project of an e-text collection that we have on Fidel Castro speeches. And she focused in on the inauguration, the building inauguration speeches and mapped them out to try to uh, get a sense of the discourse uh, that were, that was tied to these particular uh, inaugurations. Now, um, I wanna to touch very briefly, I have like 30 seconds or so, on uh, the challenges and opportunities of working with students. Uh, one of the we're thankful, we're lucky enough to have endowment funds to be able to um, put out a competition and bring in interns and, and give them a compensated uh, experience. 
However, uh, we do, because of word of mouth and how this program is structured, we do get requests from uh, graduate students, uh, not only from the School of Information, but also from history. Um, graduate students are trying to uh, get essentially the DH experience to be able to go out on the market, uh, the academic uh, teaching market. Um, sorry about that, that's my timer. Um, and one of the, you know, the conflicts that we have is, you know, do we turn them away um, since we don't have the, compens uh, the funds to be able to compensate them or uh, do we try to provide that experience for them? And so we use this as a guiding principle that ultimately this is an educational experience. Whatever we go goals we have as an institution, as a, as a library, those are secondary to their uh, educational experience. Some other challenges are uh, being able to bring in and compensate international students. The bureaucratic process has been very extensive and very elaborate and, and al always changing. Um, uh, however, based on feedback, you know, it seems like it's worth it in the long run, even though for us it's been uh, difficult to try to navigate through that. Um, we're still maintaining that, uh, uh, that international program. And the last one is time commitment. Uh, it is very demanding on our time. However, we do see um, the, the mentorship experience that not only I, but also the team in general um, develops with these graduate and undergraduate students has really uh, been rewarding for us all. Uh, and also the products that come out of it are just really great uh, in terms of seeing them look at these collections and through a different lens, the digital lens, and being able to uh, really build on their technical and uh, uh, knowledge base. Anyways, thank you very much for your attention. Sorry I went overboard or uh, over time. No, no, no problem. Uh, and also, thank you for having a timer. <laughs> that's, that's very uh, nice from you. Um, so we are going to go through all the presentations and then allow for some time uh, for questions. Um, so uh, Daniela, um, or Becca, who, or who? who I can go. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Sí. So. ¿En español o en inglés? En inglés lo ya he hecho. Bueno, dale. Um, ya. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. So, well, my name is Daniela Schute, and I work at the National Library of Chile. Uh, and I would like to very briefly share with you some ideas uh, and projects that our team has been working on for the last years. And also some ideas that I think it might be helpful for libraries, archives, and documentation centers when we speak about digital humanities. So, but first, there's a couple of quotes that I would like to ask you to keep in mind as we go through the slides. The first one is probably known and appreciated by everyone, by Padini Rai Murray, quoted by Rupika Rissam, your DH is not my DH, and that is a good thing. The second one is from Jeffrey Snap and his Digital Humanities Manifesto. We have the banner of digital humanities for tactical reason. Think of it as strategic, strategic essentialism, not out of convic conviction that the phrase adequately describes the tectonic shifts embraced. The phrase has a value to the degree that it can serve as an umbrella under which to group both people and projects seeking to reshape and reinvigorate contemporary arts, humanities practice, and expand their boundaries. At the moment, at the National Library of Chile, we have three digital services for our users. The first one is National Digital Library, the second one, Memoria Chilena, and Chile para Niños. National Digital Library centralizes the access to all of our digital services. This platform provides access to more than 266,000 printed digitized materials and 93,680 audiovisual records. Memoria Chilena, is an ecosystem of digital contents that articulate a network that is filled with digitized documents, um, contents created by our own team and the semantic relationship built between them. And Tilebara Niños 
is a project that sought to bring the national bibli bibliographical heritage closer to children. Using the diary or blog concept, the contents of Chile para Niños uh, are presented as thematic mini sites written by Memoriosa, a very curious little girl who lives at the National Library, and her two friends, that you can see them at the right of the screen, uh, the Medina Owl, a very old, a very old, a wise old bird, and the butterfly that collects memories and brings them back to the library. The core of the National Digital Library and soon uh, of all of our projects is our new uh, digital collection viewer uh, launched on November of last year. The most remarkable aspects of this in-house development, at least for us, are that it is a viewer and repository of our digital collection. It has two integration modalities, as a light box and an application for integration with Primo and Alef, our uh, bibliographical uh, software, and soon Memoria Triana. It also um, gives, as you can see on the right of the photograph, uh, a leading role to digital objects metadata, binding them directly to the digital objects themselves. And in terms of stability and consistency of the collection, centralizes all the digital collections around the system number of our bibliographic uh, catalog. And the last and more, uh, possibly the most interesting part is that during the implementation process, we had the chance to check and adjust our technical processes, mainly those related to data quality and accuracy of the catalographic records and local descriptor. This, we had the chance to re review and check and uh, perfection the storage of digital collections. And uh, we have the, the, the chance to improve and simplify the upload, uploading procedures for new uh, objects and collections. Of course, the process wasn't easy. Here's our expectation of how it was supposed to be. And here is what actually happened. And I think I may have missed a few arrows and marks here and there, here and there because it was a very complex uh, procedure. Um, as chaotic as the process may have been, on November 2018, we were able to launch our new digital collection viewer that very, very schematically looked something like this. A two-file system and a streaming server on the first level uh, that are read through a daily index process. This process saved the location of the files and their IDs. Uh, both as, are stored in a very simple SQLite database that is also fed by the input of the bibliographical data from our catalog. And also every Friday night at 11 p.m. it syncs up in order to keep metadata updated. I said that the viewer was the core of our digital services, and in fact it is. It's the final destination when you access a bibliographic record that, of digitized document in the bibliography bibliographic catalog. It's your final destination, as you can see on the bottom left, uh, uh, when you enter a city, a town, or a region through our territorial digital libraries in which every region of the country has its own digital library, uh, thanks to the geolocation of the geographical entities included in the subject of the catalographic records. Um, as you can see on the bottom right, uh, is your destination also when you enter each of the collection of the National Digital Library that is organized exactly as the real library is. I mean, it has a photographic uh, archive, <clears throat> uh, the newspapers and magazine section, the writer, writer's archive, ephemeral section, etc. Also, when you visit Memoria Chilena on the bottom right, uh, you, visit, uh, you can access to when you have digitized uh, complementary sources that uh, serve the, the mini site you are visiting in Memoria Chilena. And finally, uh, it will also be your final destination when you, when you access, for example, our heritage map uh, service, Mapas Patrimoniales, uh, where you can visit a set of, app, of, a set of apps the, where you can play with old maps and see uh, how cartographic science has evolved over the years. At the beginning, I ask you 
to keep in mind a couple of a couple of quotes. The first one was your DH are not my DH in and that is a good thing. Uh, well, my digital humanities are not a discipline themselves, nor a domain of certain sectors of the humanities, and they don't have to fulfill specific um, approaches or procedures to be catalogued as such. On the contrary, my digital humanities are a shared set of skills, knowledge, and lessons that promote the production of new knowledge and its democratization. They start with the need of breaking with the prevailing division of research uh, projects, uh, preservation of collections, cataloging and digitization. We, in my opinion, without one, the, the other does not exist and vice versa. And of course, we can agree on different outcomes, but we do need them all. I'm aware there's a long way until we can get there, uh, but in the meantime, I would like to think that possible paths and contribu contributions from libraries, archives, and documentation centers could be understanding that making a document available online does not only means digitizing it, but it also means to care about its adequate description, contextualizations, and forms, forms of access, acknowledging the dynamics of knowledge mobility in a digital environment. Also making wider the concept of what we understand as the documentary object cycle of life. The last stage would no longer be the books, the bookshelf, but its subsequent digitization, description, putting online, and its multiple possibilities of using different contexts from that point. Also highlighting the research task that the work of archives and libraries entails and with it the articulation and reformulation of services through documentation and dissemination of these, act of these actions along with intensive interinstitutional inter collaboration. Also uh, challenging ourselves to make our collections known, exploring them and proposing new forms of access, new configuration of documentary objects, cross readings that allows that allow researchers and users to approach them for their capital of knowledge. Uh, another possible path could be perceiving the term access in its broad sense, including not only connectivity into the equation as it's usually done, at least here, but above all, as the quality that allows material, materials to be found in a repository, regardless of who is on the other side of the screen. And also including, and this is very important, I think, including with, within cultural and digital public policies, strategies, budgets, and adequate infrastructure for digital preservation, and especially for experimentation in this field for the benefit of the perceived value of our collections. Uh, also, a glimping that the assets of a library or an archive are not only its collection but also its catalogic, catalogic and documentary records whose capital of knowledge not only operates in relation to the documents uh, or, the, or the set of documents they describe but are also sources of research themselves. And of course, it's very important to promote collaborative work with scholars and research groups complementing the knowledge each other produce and provoking through joint projects a bridge to the spaces neglect, neglected by both. And finally, remembering the political role of libraries, archives and documentation centers as repositories of bibliographic and documentary objects that are fundamental sources of, for our history and whose access should not imply any kind of restriction. In this sense, it is critical to consider that the description and cataloging of a bibliographic or a documentary object pre-configures its condi conditions of access and in doing so, transforms itself like digitization into a political gesture for every institution. And now please, I will ask you to, keep, to remember the keep in mind number two. Thank you. Mm -mm. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you for that. Um, and you also know that I love your uh, the yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know. know that I love the uh, Memoria Chilena project. Um, so, who wants to go next? Um, um, I can talk if you want. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Amalia. Okay. Do you hear me well? 
Yes, I can hear you, okay. um, and I think everyone else can hear you. Um, okay, so um, let me then share my screen. Um, and uh, can you see? Um, sorry. Uh, can you see my screen now? Mm, no, we can't see your screen. Uh, let me. Yes, you you should have uh, permission to share your screen now. Um, yes. There, now there, you see. Yeah. Now now we are seeing your screen. Now you see. Okay. Yes, I. Okay. Um, so I am going to talk. Um, first of all, my name is Amalia. Thank you for having me. I am calling in from Barbados. Um, I am an archivist uh, working with the Barbados archives here. Uh, and I will talk uh, over, first of all, um, from the description of the webathon, I want to focus on the question of how can the digital humanities help and encourage digitization. Uh, the second part, I will talk about the present project I'm working on. Um, Runaway slave ads from the Mercury Gazette, and then closing some closing thoughts, uh, mending gaps. Um, one thing that I want to, I will start out from uh, the very theoretic. Um, in essence, digitization is a secondary thing. Um, last year only, we had two big uh, fires that burned down the Museo Nacional in Brazil and the Folk Research Center in Saint Lucia. This year, of course, we had Notre Dame. Um, another aspect of digitization is that digitization, of course, is slow. Um, uh, until we digitize everything, everything might crumble away and become dust. Um, so as collections deteriorate, we need essentially good descriptions and catalogs and metadata in order to be able to find the material and identify links with other collections. And then, of course, um, is the assumption that everything is digitized that is online, especially when we have to do with um, primary sources and archival material. We do know that a lot has been destroyed and a lot has been um, misplaced, uh, especially and forgotten, especially in colonial contexts. Um, we have hidden collections that are not findable because they are not described. Um, and we have different levels of permissions. So, um, and then yet another thing why digitization is problematic because essentially um, um, it replicates silences in the archive. Uh, the voiceless remain locked um, away in uh, documents because documents are scanned as images, they are not searchable and of course the way that things are catalogued is that the metadata favor the creator and not those who are in the documents. And yet uh, again, uh, digitization also cannot read the multiple levels of the archival record, not only what is said, but also uh, the context, what is alluded, what is hiding, um, the misleading parts of it, and what is ambiguous. And so, um, Talking of gaps and silences, um, let me a little bit discuss about the Mercury Gazette. This is a newspaper that we digitized last year uh, with an Endangered Archives program grant. And the plan steps are first, the first step was already completed, digitization and open access. Second step is to extract data, which are the ads in this occasion. And then the third step is to enrich those data. Uh, the first uh, part, the digitization, uh, about 9,000 pages and 2,300 issues, 20 volumes, uh, end of 18th to 19th century. And they have been provided open access on the Digital Library of the Caribbean and also on the Endangered Archives program uh, portal at the British Library. Uh, there are many ways to mine the mercury. Uh, there is a lot of information, obviously, on Caribbean history, British history, maritime. So it depends on every uh, scholar, actually, how they want to mine the newspaper. One thing that we are focusing currently are the runaway slave ads that you can find in every uh, issue. People who chose to escape um, 
those are uh, quite poignant to to read. Uh, some are really tragic, um, and so this is um, an approach that is also being done uh, in a lot of um, places in the U.S. and in Europe. Other runaway slave projects. There are many out there, um, and even on Twitter. So. Um, the main rationale for this project is that if information about the enslaved uh, does not exist, we need to create it retrospectively from our collections. So essentially, uh, it is to um, locate, extract, and enrich uh, that information. So uh, as I discussed before, uh, slaves do not exist as creators of documents, but as an items in newspaper ads, in slave ships, in card plantation holdings. And so, as um, a very nice article of Jeanette Bastian mentions, the full story is not told unless the cargo has a voice and the population speaks. And so the aim is to get out the voices. Um, with the Barbados Archives, we have uh, uh, partnered with the Early Caribbean Digital Archive, an initiative at the Northeastern University in Boston. Uh, to create a digital archive of ads and crowdsource the transcriptions and create teaching opportunities for students and engage the public through workshops. The, er, the Early Caribbean Digital Archive has a, um, a subsection which is Early Caribbean Slave Narratives in which they pick up narratives uh, of slaves hidden in documents. In this case, the narrative of Clara was in footnotes. In a, in a book uh, of 1793. So what also we want to do is through workshops and work is to locate uh, such runaway ads in the newspapers, snip them out and transcribe. So this is the second step we are planning to do. After that is done and it is very much at the beginning, we are very much at the beginning yet, so we have a little bit of uh, time. So the, um, the next step will be to enrich and again, we will invite the public and particularly historians in Barbados to add other primary material. We hope in the end to be able to link to other projects, for example, the enslaved database, and reach it also with linked open data, particularly geographical data. And then through um, various digital humanities and computational approaches, as I mentioned, it is up to every scholar how they want to approach this information, is to either expose gaps and silences or maybe choose to engage, but not um, essentially uh, not shed light on them. Um, we consider ads as actions that leave traces. Uh, the runaway ads contain life stories. They contain very vivid descriptions of individuals. They show agency and courage, and, uh, but also they contain, in a sense, intentional silences. Not everything is said in those ads, either from the point of the white enslavers or the point of the um, enslaved. So there are many different ways that we can tell a story um, for, through these ads. This ad is actually a long ad about a woman who escaped with her daughter and her daughter's friends and her children. So one approach would be to approach it as a database. Um, and you can extract a lot of information. Uh, another ad, uh, another way to um, approach it is through family relationships. And um, we have seen that in the workshops that we organize, the public is very keen on extracting genealogical information, hopefully uh, helping them to uh, locate ancestors. And then uh, going out from the relationships, going to networks of people, larger networks of people. Um, you again, if using and linking to other um, external databases, such for example, like the legacies of British slave ownerships, ownership and so on. Um, DH work that can be done to engage with gaps and silences in this context of the ads. Um, first of all, the being mindful map, of course. Uh, we always think that uh, data is objective, that everything is said through data, but um, as um, in a very nice article by Jessica Marie Johnson, as she has said, uh, essentially when we have data, that data obscures the violence behind them and obscures the fact that what you cannot extract as data does not mean that it 
it's not there. It means that it cannot be either found or described. Um, so the aim and the third step that, as I was mentioning, would be to create uh, data sets that like, uh, scholars can, can use to build upon, uh, acknowledging the gaps and the biases in the data, the omissions, and also exposing the logics of the data, how data are organized and why they are organized in the way that they are organized. Um, the hope is to be able to do, by extracting networks, is to uh, position individuals that previously did not exist in the historical record to extract networks, such as, for example, the Jesuit Plantation Project um, by Sharon Leon. And then, of course, see movements, mobility and patterns, um, such as um, the Slave Revolt in Jamaica Project, uh, that's also based on um, such data. Um, of course, when we have silences and we have gaps, another way to approach the material is to speculate. For example, out of things that exist, try to imagine small worlds where the enslaved both worked and lived, and that's the um, work that, for example, Marisa Fuentes has done with um, enslaved women in, uh, in Bridgetown. Um, of course, the degree to which you speculate is up, at the end of the day, is something that each person will approach differently. Another important thing is go, to go beyond text, it's simply because uh, sometimes uh, records are not only text, but it's also material culture. And we see, we do have material culture that usually the enslaved is in the second, um, at, uh, at the background, so um, blending such information. And then yet another, um, Possibility would be to use um, uh, possibilities that uh, engendered by augmented reality or uh, overlaying information on contemporary maps, like we saw previously, um, overlaying uh, old pictures on contemporary maps. Um, I will do some closing remarks by talking about mindful digitization. What's the meaning of that? Um, that we need always to keep in mind that digitization is always a process of selection. Of selection, sorry. It depends, of course, who decides what to get is to be digitized, uh, who funds the project, who is giving the funds, and who eventually has access to these um, digitized results. Uh, and also, it goes back to what do we value? Uh, do we value digitize everything with no distinction, or putting in the grant work? Uh, that endangered collections need, either from point of view of description or from point of view of preservation. Uh, mindfulness and open access, also in the same by the same token, while open access is the holy grail for many, um, there are also approaches that s say that when dealing with um, information, particularly pertaining to indigenous uh, people or native communities, um, does information really want to be free? And uh, Kimberly Christen has written an article on that. Um, and there are in place um, archival systems like Mukurtu that try to, um, in a sense, restrict access to members of that community or not essentially restrict, but control access. Um, and then always remember that Sometimes there are intentional silences, maybe because people didn't want to reveal um, everything about themselves, and we need to respect that. And talking about respect, um, particularly when working with communities, um, always we need to understand that uh, there are boundaries, and um, there needs always to be a respect there. And we should try to avoid neo-colonial approach. Uh, neo-colonial approaches, which are usually approaches that try to extract from host um, populations. And also always to keep in mind that we are outsiders um, in a project. And so, you know, pre uh, behave accordingly. And with this, I would like to, to finish and thank you. And please get in touch if you need any uh, clarification. Well, thank you, Amalia. I think that was a great presentation. Um, I, I really enjoyed it, and I think that you brought really interesting points. Um, so, um, Becca, I'm sorry, um, 
because we are running, well, we have 20 minutes, yeah. So, um, yeah, so keep that in mind because we also want to leave some space for questions if there are any. Um, and so, yeah. please. Okay, so I'm just going to figure out how to share my screen. One sec, you, sorry. You have a Buddha, uh, sorry, a small button there. Um, that says share. I do. Um, I just need to find it. I have a few too many windows open <laughs> at the moment, which I think happens to everybody. Okay. Meanwhile, um, while Becca finds out that, maybe if you have questions, you can leave them in the chat and yes. we can maybe have a look at them or uh, right now and then collect them by the end of the session. Hi, Jimena. Hi, Becca. <laughs> I, I was here all the time, ah, hidden yeah. under the Humanidades Digitales sign. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you see my screen now? Oh, no. No. No, still not. Oh. Come, technology. I think that we are still seeing. Um, Yes, we're we are still seeing Amalia's, but I have put Can the you stop uh, Amalia's presentation. Um, yeah. Not, now I think that you we we are going to see you, Becca. Try again. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry for this. Yes. No, no, that's okay. I I think that may have been my doing actually. Um. So thank you. It's fantastic to be here, and it's great to see projects that I have only known about at a distance. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to, to this group, which is not a group that I have much contact with in the day-to-day -day work at Pelagius. So this is a real joy and a great opportunity. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rebecca Kahn. I'm a researcher at the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society in Berlin. And I'm also the director of collections at the Pelagius Project, or the Pelagius Network, as we're now known. Um, and what I would like to talk about today a little bit is, um, I think it's quite fitting that I'm speaking at the end because what I'm going to speak about is Peripleo, which is a tool that we developed as a mechanism to explore um, a mass of linked data collections. So um, it's an aggregating tool and an aggregated visualization tool for linked open data collections and cultural heritage collections in particular. So what Peripleo basically is, is um, it's a map-based visualization for exploring linked open data relationships. And the way that it works is actually quite simple. Um, the API, our Peripleo API provides machine readable access to our data. Um, and the mental model behind that is that there are three types of entities that exist in most of the collections that we work with. Items, which would be archaeological artifacts, literary texts, or photographs. Um, places to which these items are related. So places that might be mentioned in a text or the find spot of an artifact. Um, and data sets, which are collections of items. So either a particular museum's collection or a data corpus that's been published by an institution. Um, and these data sets can be hierarchical. So for example, you could have a data set that's subdivided into um, a corpus of say Greek and Latin literary texts, or likewise an item such as Herodotus's The Histories, which can be divided into individual books. And I should probably point out at this point that most of the material that we work with is um, material from the ancient Mediterranean world. So I'm, I'm not a classicist by background, so I've had to learn a lot about ancient Greece and Rome. Um, and this tends to be the type of material that uh, you can access through Peripleo, but it's not the only material. Um, essentially, the most significant concept behind Peripleo is that it's a mechanism for conflating records. So every item, place, person, object, or time period is a collection of records that we're pulling from different linked open data sources. So for example, there you see the results in Peripleo for Rome or Roma. Um, and you can see there are connections there to three different gazetteers of places which have been sucked in through the API. Um, what is interesting for us is that 
the way that Peripleo has been designed is that you can think about, I think like Mal Amalia mentioned, you can think about objects and you can think about places and those are quite individualized ways of thinking about historical records. The other way to think about it is to think of them as traces. So the traces are the sort of breadcrumbs of existence that things leave behind through collections or that places leave behind through materials. So for example, when you search for something like a tetradrachm, a coin type, um, that coin may have left its traces in one place, but it may also have traces in many other places. And so one of the ways in which Peripleo has been designed is that um, it doesn't correspond its results one to one. So uh, this result here that you find when you search for tetradrachm, you have 7,000 results. Um, those do that doesn't match directly to the number of dots that you see on the visualization. What you get is um, an aggregation. So what we want it to do is really encourage people to kind of dive in and start searching horizontally through the materials available and through the collections and connections available, rather than looking specifically for evidence of a one-to-one -one connection. <clears throat> Another way that you could think about it is to think about many places. So um, the Bordeaux itinerary is a really good example. Uh, it's an itinerary that is stored in one um, text, but Basically, what we, you could do is by looking through the Bordeaux itinerary, you can see the route from uh, what was then um, France and kind of medieval France to the Holy Land. Um, it was a well-known pilgrimage route. It was documented. Um, there are many places linked there, but essentially they, they belong to one item, one trace. Um, there are also kind of narrative traces or entity aware searches. So, or the possibility to search for sort of in, using entity aware search mechanisms. So for example, if you look for a sort of abstract concept like a crocodile, what we can see is um, the results that you find are results of the mention of crocodiles in particular texts. And then where those texts are located, um, you can see there in Herodotus particularly, uh, these are the regions in which crocodile was mentioned. So it kind of makes sense if you're thinking you see what was um, ancient Egypt there, that there are discussions about crocodiles that come up as a result. Um, so these are sort of the three ways that you could think about using Peripleo to search for objects, to search for places, and to search for concepts. Um, and the way that the technology behind it works is that essentially you have one place or one object which itself is connected to many different records. So as you can see there, um, with a combination of close, close and exact matches, um, what Peripleo does is it pulls in all of these different sources um, to give a sort of aggregated uh, result. Um, and what that means is that because we've taken this decentralized approach to the, the data model behind Peripleo, um, what we can also do is think about navigating between data sets that are coming from different sources. So we've been working very closely with the World Historical Gazetteer Project, which is based out of the University of Pittsburgh at the moment. Um, and what has emerged is a data model which extends the scope to what we see here, um, the sort of very broad connections between multitude of different sources, which then allows us to pull sources, which come in all different forms, come in many different forms. So RDF, JSON-LD and GeoJSON, depending on what it is that you're working with and, and what it is that you're wanting to do with the material. Um, and also what it allows us to finally start doing is thinking about um, temporal relations between objects, not just spatial relations. So up until now, we've been fairly restricted by being, a, by being um, constrained by place data and 
geodata as the kind of guiding data model uh, that we've had to use. But now we have a slightly more flexible model by working with this linked places data model. So what I thought I would do, because this is all fairly theoretical at the moment, what I thought I would do is actually hop over into Periplayer and give a short demo um, of how we can use it and what can be done with it. Because I think otherwise it, it, it's all just slides and you know, slides don't always give an accurate description. So if you go into Periplayer and you decide to do a search for a place, such as Alexandria, you can see you automatically get a couple of results, but none of those are what I'm interested in. And I'm then able to get a much broader set of results. Now, what you can do with Periplay is you can filter your results by sources and hopefully in the future by topic people and by periods. You can, there's a sort of a workaround for filtering by period in that you can use this time slider which you can either zoom in and out of to have a much more specific place. You can also just slide it across to get different results. And as you see, there's not much change to the map, but if I'm fairly sure that the Alexandria that I'm interested in is the one that has all of these results, then I can zoom in a little bit and zoom in on the actual map a little too. And then once I have that Alexandria, firstly I can see the linked data results behind it. So I have a sense of the scope of sources. And of course I can click on any of those and find the result. So in this case from the German National Library. Um, and then what I can also do, if I can figure out how to close this window, there we go, um, is I can see which items in the various data sources that we have might link to that. And again, we have an enormous number of results from a range of different periods. I can filter those by sources too and see which one of them might be particularly interesting to me. We have an enormous amount of um, coin and numismatic material because the numismatists are particularly good at making very good linked data databases. Um, so that's a lot of what we've got at the moment, but it's not only. Um, and then what I would be able to do is kind of filter down and deeper and deeper and deeper until I found what I was looking for. There's also a possibility to look to change the base map of these maps. So you can have a look at it using the digital atlas of the Roman Empire map. Seems a little slow today. Um, so maybe not the best option for us. Um, yeah, and we're also running a little bit out of time. Um, oh, okay, well then that's great because I could play around with this forever. <laughs> but this is actually very helpful to keep me moving. Um, so what I will do very quickly then is just one final search for an object because there's just one more thing I would like to show you. And that is that if you do search for an object, we've also now um, built in IIIF capabilities into this. So if an object is available using a IIIF viewer, if it's not too slow, it should pop up in that window then you would be able to actually see the object itself. Um, but as a kind of final point, what I would like to do is just jump ahead then to show this information. So um, if you're interested in using Periplayo, and it's a very useful tool, I think, for teaching and for showing the value of linked open data, there's a link there. Um, the code is open, it's in GitHub. You're also, um, Pelagius as a project and as a network is always happy to have more people join it. And I would say uh, the more people we can get joining it who are working on 
collections from periods that are a little later than the ancient Mediterranean world and that are outside of the ancient Mediterranean world, the better. Um, that would always be appreciated by us. Um, and if you need to get in touch with us, there's a website and mailing list, which you're welcome to join and our Twitter. Um, and yeah, I think then I'll wrap it up there. Well, thank you, Becca. That was a super interesting um, presentation on exploring like the opportunities of linked open data. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. Um, so we don't have a lot of time and we also need to um, leave some uh, space. Uh, so Jimena can start the next meeting uh, that is right after this one. Um, so I don't know if there's, um, I know I have a lot of questions, <laughs> um, but uh, probably I shouldn't make them all. Um, and so I want to see if someone has any question and I'm seeing, um, yeah, so I'm seeing that Jimena is also sharing the link for the next meeting. Um, does anyone have a question? As we're running out of time, I, I have a lot of questions, but I, I maybe it, I think that from this session that was really very interesting. One really interesting thing that came to me while you uh, all were talking is this kind of challenge that we have in which it's not enough to open, uh, but we should be like ready to work in the intersections uh, library, librarians, uh, people from technology and linked open data, researchers, students, and, and that is, I think, something that comes from all your presentations and is really something we should all be thinking on how not only that opening is really important, but also opening in many ways and, and, and creating knowledge from, from what we have there creating a new knowledge, not only showing, but letting others create from, from what we are, from what we're doing. They were really great presentations. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that uh, your comments, uh, Jimena, go exactly in the direction of the question that I had, right? That it was like, we won't have any time to cover unless you're actually able to tell me in half a minute. <laughs> half a minute, um, yes. <laughs> What, what do you think it's like the future of all this, right? Because I think that you made a, a lot of emphasis, very interesting emphasis on like how this helps uh, raise awareness and education, how this helps to um, actually be mindful about what you are digitalizing and how you are doing it. Um, and so I, I, and like, I think that in a way you also show like all the possibilities that the new technologies are, um, opening uh so if you want to try to answer how it is how does the future like in less than half a minute <laughs> you are all more than welcome if not we'll shut then the meeting we can continue this in twitter i think yeah uh, okay Thanks. thank you all. thank you Thanks all a lot for being thank here you. yeah thank you for organizing it yeah, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you, Jimena. Bye. Bye. Bye.